Greetings. This is a longer discussion on belief number 24. Now again, all of these beliefs, as I am reading from, you can find the PDF. You can go and Google and you can find the PDF of the 28 Fundamental Beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Belief number 24 is Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. There is a sanctuary in heaven, the true tabernacle that the Lord set up and not humans. In it, Christ ministers on our behalf, making available to believers the benefits of his atoning sacrifice offered once for all on the cross. At his ascension, he was inaugurated as our great high priest and began his intercessory ministry, which was typified by the work of the high priest in the holy place of the earthly sanctuary. In 1844, at the end of the prophetic period of 2300 days, he entered the second and last phase of his atoning ministry, which was typified by the work of the high priest in the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary. It is a work of investigative judgment, which is part of the ultimate disposition of all sin, typified by the cleansing of the ancient Hebrew sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. In that typical service, the sanctuary was cleansed with the blood of animal sacrifices, but the heavenly things are purified with the perfect sacrifice of the blood of Jesus. The investigative judgment reveals a, to heavenly intelligences who among the dead are asleep in Christ, and therefore in him, are deemed worthy to have part in the first resurrection. It also makes manifest who among the living are abiding in Christ, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and in him therefore are ready for translation into his eternal, uh, his everlasting kingdom. The judgment vindicates the justice of God in saving those who believe in Jesus. It declares that those who have remained loyal to God shall receive the kingdom. The completion of this ministry of Christ will mark the close of human probation before the second advent. And these are the texts that are located underneath this uh, statement of the fundamental belief 24. And I'm not going to go through all of these. And I'm going to go through some that are not mentioned here. Now, in Leviticus chapter 16, we read about the Day of Atonement within the earthly sanctuary. And in verse 15, we read about the high priest. Then he, that is the high priest, shall kill the goat of the sin offering. So we're looking at the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil. Do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, that golden box that had the Ten Commandments, among other things, in it. Leviticus 16, 19 goes on to say, Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it. Cleansing is a key word in the book of Leviticus and, and purity as well are key words or key concepts in the book of Leviticus and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So the sanctuary was to be cleansed from the uncleanness. Now, if we go in our Bible, and I'm, I'm gonna read verse 20, but first I, I didn't put this in the presentation, but if we go in our Bible, and this is just one area to see this, and we go to the book of 1 Kings chapter 5 and verse number 5, we see here that it says, And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to my father, saying, my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne, in your place, he shall build the house.
for my name. So the sanctuary was the place for the name of God. Name in the Bible also refers to character, reputation. So when we keep that in mind, we realize that this Day of Atonement had to do with a way of symbolizing the cleansing of the reputation of God. What is it that is one of the things, one of the key things that, that brings the reputation or the character of God into question is how God deals with sin. Now think about it a minute. If you could be a sinner, if you could have done all kinds of terrible things, rape, kill, murder, and then you could repent and you could be born again and you could enter into the new heaven and the new earth through the blood of Christ. That raises questions. The way God deals with sin raises questions about his reputation. And so that is one of the things that is being symbolized by this very important ceremony, the cleansing of the sanctuary. But it's all in symbols. But it has to do with the gospel. And it also has to do with the people who have accepted the gospel. And it also has to do with the reputation of God in relation to the gospel and how he deals with sin. Now let me continue in verse number 20. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle. So we have actually are having a cleansing of the tabernacle, an atonement for the tabernacle, which is the place where the name of God dwells, or the reputation of God. And so this cleansing of this reputation of God. Now, obviously, God is perfect. God is holy. Obviously, there is no sin in God's presence, in his actual presence. But sin leaves a question, a question mark concerning who God is and concerning his reputation and his character. The tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Okay, let me read that again. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. So we looked at the goat of the sin offering. Now we're going to look at the live goat. And what happens here? Aaron shall, what? He shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins. Okay? So he's confessing over the head of this live goat all of these sins, putting them. So what we're dealing it with is sin being put in its rightful place. Putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. So what does that goat represent? That all the sins are put on its head. That goat represents Satan. So what we see here is a symbol representing sin put in its rightful place. And we could say that in the understanding of those who truly study the word of God, those who truly understand the gospel, those who accept Christ, Sin is put in its rightful place. We, un, in other words, in our understanding. See, we live in a world where the character of God has been attacked. And sin has caused a great confusion and how God deals with sin. And the things going on in this world as a result of sin have caused many questions to be raised about God. And so God's people have a duty to put sin in its rightful place as we reveal the gospel to people. As we explain, oh, the source of sin is the devil. And so when we look at these things, we have to keep these things in mind as we look at these symbols. And I'm going to continue on here. Leviticus 16, 29. This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all. So the people are to afflict their souls, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. So there is this concept of afflicting the soul. People had to afflict their souls. They had to, they had to consider whether or not they were afflicting their souls. So there is this self-investigation. There is a connection 
between the people and what is going on. And the people had to afflict their souls. There is a connection between the people and the priests. There is a connection between the people and the ceremonies of the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 23, 27. Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So the people had to have this introspective self-evaluation and they had to afflict their souls and they had to be very careful to do this on this day. It was a day of deep prayer. It was a day of soul searching. And you shall do no work on that same day. So it is a Sabbath day of rest. In other words, you've got to turn your mind to holy things. It is a prayerful day. For it is the day of atonement. To make atonement for you before the Lord your God. You've got to think about what this means. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. Now this is an illustration based on the Holman Illustrated uh, Bible Dictionary illustration of the ancient Hebrew calendar. And so here are our months of the calendar with uh, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August. And so these are our months. These are the Hebrew months, ancient Hebrew calendar months, and how they relate to our months. Okay, and Nisan is the first month of the Hebrew calendar. And so the seventh month is Tishri. These are things that would go on during the year in the Hebrew calendar. You had the early rains. And you had the latter rains, early rains, and the latter rains to prepare for the harvest. Now, as we look at this calendar, we see when during the year the Hebrew festivals would fall. Passover unleavened bread, first fruits, in the first month, Nisan. Pentecost, Pentecost would fall during the third month. Pentecost was the time in the New Testament when the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, came upon the people with tongues of fire and they started speaking in tongues. That was Pentecost. Jesus was crucified at the Passover time. It's very interesting. Trumpets, atonement, tabernacles were during the seventh month. And the seventh month and the tenth day of the month was the day of atonement. And then after that, tabernacles. And it reminds us of the final tabernacling of God with his people in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, Daniel chapter 7. We're going to look in Daniel because Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14 refers to a cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. It also in that chapter refers to an attack on the heavenly sanctuary. But to put that in context, we're going to be looking in Daniel 7 a little bit. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, we read of four beasts, four beasts. Daniel 7, 17 reveals those great beasts, which are four, are four kings. So these beasts represent kings, which shall arise out of the earth. Now, here's a little illustration of the four beasts of Daniel chapter seven. And they correspond to the four metals in Daniel chapter 2. And in Daniel chapter 2, the interpretation is given that these are king, kingdoms. The first one was clearly Babylon in the days of Daniel. Then 
taking over after Babylon was Medo-Persia. We read about that event in Daniel chapter 5. Then Greece came next. Then Rome. And then the divided kingdoms that came out of Rome, also corresponding to the ten horns. And then during that time, a strange ecclesiastical or spiritual kingdom arose during the divisions of the Roman, Western Roman Empire. And so these are the horns on the head of this Roman beast. So we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And then the beginnings of modern Europe that came out of Rome and this strange Roman church kingdom. And there he is speaking words of blasphemy, according to the imagery that's provided in, in Daniel chapter 7 and also Daniel chapter 8. So here we have the dates of when these kings, were, kingdoms were coming into power. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and then the divided kingdoms where the, the beginnings of these divisions of modern Europe was the dividing up of the Western Roman Empire, 476 AD, and then after that rose this strange church kingdom. Now Daniel 7, 23 to 25 goes on to tell us, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. So the beast is synonymous with king, and king is synonymous with kingdom. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on the earth which shall be different from all the other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings, and we know kings is synonymous with kingdoms, so ten kingdoms who shall arise from this kingdom or from the fourth kingdom, which is Rome, which is the kingdom of the New Testament. In Jesus' time, Rome was in power. So the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise, and this is the beginnings of modern Western Europe, these ten kingdoms coming out of the divisions of the Western Roman Empire that the Germanic people were instrumental in orchestrating, who shall arise from this kingdom. And another shall arise after them. This is the strange horn with the eyes and mouth. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings or three kingdoms that were in his way in the way of his power. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. See, his, his activity is spiritual. He is speaking against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. He shall intend to change times and law of the Most High. And then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Now in Daniel chapter 8, 9 to 17, we read, out of one of them, came a little horn out of one of them. So this is a little horn again, and we see that it is corresponding to a kingdom. And this is referring to the Roman kingdom, a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land. And now we see the papal Roman, the papal Roman, the ecclesiastical Roman activity, or the vertical phase of this kingdom. So we have the horizontal phase of pagan Rome in verse 9, south, east, glorious land. So those vertical uh, or those horizontal orientations. So the horizontal phase, horizontal phase, verse 9, vertical phase, verse 10, and it shall grow up, up to the host of heaven and shall cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trample them, okay, attacking the things of heaven. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. So again, a vertical attack, a spiritual attack. And by him, the daily sacrifices, and it, the word sacrifices is applied there. So this is referring to the daily ministry, the daily ministry what? In heaven were taken away and the place of his sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary was cast down. So this is an attack on the sanctuary of God. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices and he cast truth down to the ground. So this is an attack on the truth of God, a vertical attack. 
his spiritual attack. He did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? He said to me, For 2,300 days, or literally evenings, mornings, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So we're talking about the heavenly sanctuary. Let, then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. So this vision in chapter 8 refers to the time of the end. And Gabriel is going to help Daniel understand the vision, and particularly the number aspect, the 23 evenings, mornings. And Hebrew words for vision in this chapter reveal that, particularly the number aspect. Daniel 8, 20 and 21, in, within Gabriel's interpretation, we read, The ram which you saw, there is a ram in the vision when you start in the beginning of the chapter, the ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Medo-Persia. And as I mentioned, Medo-Persia came to power and defeated Babylon. Who defeated Medo-Persia? And the male goat, now in the vision, a goat defeats the ram. The male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. So during the unified Greek kingdom of Alexander the Great, of Alexander the Great, Medo-Persia was defeated and Greece took over. Daniel 8, 26 and 27 tells us, and the vision of the evening's morning. So the entire vision is referred to as the vision of the evening's mornings. How many evening's mornings are there? As we saw in verse 14, 2300. But the vision starts with Medo-Persia. And the vision of the evening's mornings, which was told, is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. They still needed understanding. So here we see how these symbols relate to one another. We see Babylon is symbolized by the head of gold in the vision of chapter 2 of Daniel, by the lion-like beast in chapter 7 of Daniel. In chapter 2 of Daniel, Medo-Persia is symbolized as the silver of the chest of the image, by the bear with one side higher than the other in chapter 7, and by a ram with one horn higher than the other in chapter 8. And then Greece is symbolized by bronze, chapter 2. Chapter 7, a four-headed four -headed leopard with four wings. And a goat in chapter 8 with one horn that ended up breaking up into four because the Greek empire was eventually divided up into four after Alexander the Great died. So you had the one horn that was broken and then four in its place, corresponding with the four heads. And then we have the legs of iron, representing Rome. The beast with iron teeth, the correspondence there. And then we have, that is corresponding with the horn that we were reading about in chapter 8, in its pagan Roman phase, or in its horizontal phase, pagan Rome. Then we have the time of the ten toes, reminding us of the time of the ten horns, or the divisions of the Western Roman Empire. And then we have the spiritual Roman kingdom, that strange horn, which again corresponds to what we read in chapter 8 of the, the, the vertical phase of Rome, the vertical or spiritual phase of Rome. So we have the, the horizontal phase of Rome, pagan Rome, we have the vertical phase of Rome, papal Rome. And so this is how they all relate to one another. 
And so there I have my little illustration there, that animation is showing how there is the horizontal phase of the horn and then the vertical phase of the horn, corresponding to pagan and papal Rome. So Gabriel is there to make Daniel understand the vision. He says the ram is Medo-Persia. It has one horn higher than the other, just as the bear had one side higher than the other. Medo-Persia defeated Babylon. Gabriel tells Daniel that the goat represents Greece. The goat ends up with four horns, just as the leopard had four heads. After the death of Alexander the Great, his kingdom was divided among his four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. Daniel 8 and verse 9 tells us the little horn, which represented the pagan Roman face, the little horn grew exceedingly great, grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land, the horizontal temporal conquest of Rome during its pagan phase. Rome would arise to power during the later days of the divided Greek empire, according to Daniel 8, 23. Daniel 8, 23. Daniel 8, 10 and 12 deal with the vertical, the spiritual conquest of Rome during its papal phase opposes the sanctuary of God and the daily, the daily ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. Daniel 9, 21 to 27. Now, as I said, at the end of Daniel chapter 8, Daniel still didn't quite understand the vision. So here we read in Daniel 9, 21 to 27. Yes, while I was still speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked, to, and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have come now, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand so he had seen Daniel in the vision of chapter 8. There is no vision in chapter 9, and that vision is referred to in verse 21. And then he goes to help again Daniel understand, because Daniel didn't understand by the end of chapter 8. In verse 23, at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. And it was particularly the number aspect of the vision. 2,300 days, then the sanctuary would be cleansed. Now, the vision of chapter 8, the entire vision was referred to as evening and mornings, and how long was it? 2,300 evenings and mornings, or 2,300 days. And so we know from the context that that can't be 2,300 literal days, because that is too short a time for the rise and fall of these nations. But it fits with years. It fits with years. So we're really talking about years, 2,300 years. Well, to help Daniel understand the beginning of that 2300 years, which obviously happened during the time of Medo-Persia, that, uh, that was the beginning rather, the beginning of the 2300 years would begin in the time of Medo-Persia, Medo -Persia, but when? That is what Gabriel is to help Daniel understand. Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. See, that was Daniel's concern. How do our people uh, play into this? So, so Gabriel is answering that, and yet at the same time, he's giving a, a prophecy that applies to his people, to the Jewish nation, yet at the same time, this prophecy will also reveal the beginning of the 2300 years. 70 weeks, 70 weeks are determined for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, which comes after the seven weeks, as we just saw, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war, desolations are determined. 27, then he shall confirm, that is the Messiah, shall confirm 
a covenant with many for one week, and this is the final week of the 70 weeks, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings by becoming the ultimate sacrifice on the cross. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So when does this 70 weeks start exactly? How does it end? How long is it? 70 weeks, 490 days or years, as we see days or years in this context, set aside for the Jewish nation. That was what Daniel wanted to know about, but he also wanted to understand a 2300 day prophecy. So this prophecy is going to help him understand that one, the 2300 days or the 2300 aspect of the vision of chapter eight. When does it start? Well, from clearly we see from verse 25, it starts from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. When did that happen? Well, we see there are seven weeks mentioned, that is 49 years, days or years, plus 62, that's 434 days or years, brings us to a total of 483 days or years. 483 days or years are mentioned in this verse. But when does it start? When does it start? Well, clearly, at the time of restoring. And when did this... Now, restoring means return. So it's not simply beginning, be, uh, rebuilding. Restoring means return or giving, giving back. And we have certain passages in the Bible that reveal that to restore is to return. But Elath, uh, he built Elath and restored it to Judah. He built it. That's one thing. He restored it. He returned it. Again, another reference is in 1 Kings 20, 34. The cities which my father took from your father I will restore. And again, restore all that was hers. 2 Kings 8, 6, always of revealing that to restore means return. So when was Jerusalem restored? Well, we see it in Ezra 7, 6, starting in Ezra 7, 6. This Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord, his God, upon him. Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, the Nethanim, came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Now we have a year, the seventh year, and that was when this restoring happens. How do we know? We jump down, we look into the words of the decree in verse 25, and we see, and you, Ezra, according to your God-given wisdom, set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people. So self, their, their, their ability to govern themselves is being restored to them. Their authority is being restored to them. And that's what we're seeing. This is when the restoration happens. And that is the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. So when is the seventh year of King Artaxerxes? 457 BC. History shows us that. 457 BC is the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Then we, what do we read happening here? After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. And, and as we saw, that 62 weeks was after that seven weeks. So after 69 weeks, which is 483 years, Messiah will be cut off. Now, in prophecy, as we saw from the context, a day is a year, but we could also see these other references to that. In Numbers 14.34, Ezekiel 4.6 shows us the same thing. A day is a year in prophecy. But I've shown you from the context as well. So starting 457, 69 weeks, 483 years, we end up 27 AD. So sometime after 27 AD, the Messiah would be cut off. There would be the rejection of Jesus. What does it say would happen in that final week? He, that is Messiah, will confirm the covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end of sacrifice and offering. How? By becoming the ultimate sacrifice. So that final week would bring us from 27 AD to 34 AD, and right in the middle, 31 AD, that is when Jesus would be crucified. See, this prophecy is pinpointing the year of Jesus' crucifixion. And so, we have 
all of these elements of this 70-week prophecy mapped out. All of these elements of the 70-week prophecy mapped, mapped out here. And the crucifixion of Jesus in the final week. Now you could see more on that in my presentation on spiritual Israel and the new earth. But A.D. 27, Christ is baptized about 30 years of age, according to Luke 3.1, and we see a reference there, 21 to 23. So he begins his earthly ministry. He's crucified about three and a half years later, 31 A.D. Now, how did all of this help Daniel? As we saw, the vision of chapter 8 began with Medo-Persia symbolized as a ram. Well, this decree went forth from a Medo-Persian king, Artaxerxes, in 457 BC. So we are now pinpointing the time during the Medo-Persian time when the 70-week prophecy begins, but also it would help Daniel understand when the 2300, the 2300 year prophecy begins. That's, that was the point for Daniel to understand the number aspect of the vision, but also to answer his concerns about his own people, which were his concerns if you read his long prayer in chapter 9. And so if we start from 457 BC, we end up 1844. Jesus cleanses the heavenly sanctuary. So the 70-week prophecy was to help Daniel understand the vision of chapter 8. So the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary starts 1844. The sanctuary had two rooms, the holy and the most holy place. During the daily ministry, the priests entered the holy place. Once a year, the yearly ministry, the high priest would enter the most holy place. But into the second part of the high priest, but into the second part or the second room of the sanctuary, the high priest. So we have a daily ministry, we have the yearly ministry. On the day of atonement, the high priest went alone once a year into the second part of the sanctuary, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So here we have a little diagram. This I didn't uh, write this. I don't remember the source. Oh, I didn't uh, illustrate this, but this is a diagram. We have the outer court of the sanctuary represented in this section, the holy place, the first apartment of the sanctuary, and then the most holy place, which is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And this is my own diagram that I made. And so you have the holy place, and then you have the most holy place. The daily, the continual. What happened during the daily ministry throughout the year? The trimming of the lamps. Lamb every evening and morning was offered. There was drink offerings. There was incense, prayer at the time of incense. There were 24 divisions of priests to serve throughout the year in the daily. And these are references to that. The sin offering and other offerings were given throughout the year as well. The yearly day of atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, we read a little bit of, and there's some references in Leviticus chapter 16. Blood was brought of the sacrifice of the goat inside the veil, to sprinkle on the mercy seat. According to Roy Gain in his book, Altar Call, the scholar Roy Gain, First, careful comparison between Leviticus 4 and 16 shows that there was a reversal in the order of blood applications performed in the holy place. When blood was applied in the holy place during the year, Leviticus 4, it moved toward the ark, indicating that sin carried by the blood was moving into the sanctuary. But on the Day of Atonement, the blood moved away from the ark. Remember I said sin moved in its rightful place, away from the ark, showing that sin was moving out of the sanctuary. So here's a little drawing of the Ark of the Covenant, simple, simple illustration of it as a box with the cherubim on the top, the Shekinah glory of God above that. Inside of the Ark, a cutaway showing that, among other things, there was, a, there was the law of God. There was also manna and Aaron's rod that had budded. On the Day of Atonement, the blood was put on the atonement cover or the mercy seat, and the blood representing the blood of Christ. And so, the image from the Day of Atonement. 
then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the, the, for the people. Bring the blood inside the veil, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. They shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat, according to Exodus 25.20. 20. So the cherubim were looking down at the mercy seat where the blood was. So we have this image of investigation, an image of investigation here. And the blood would cover God's people. So we have an image of investigation. Who are God's people? And we see this symbol symbolized in these, in these practices. The blood of atonement goat re represented the blood of, the, of Christ and the gospel. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. We read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. Previously saying sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he might establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, through Christ, justified by his blood. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? And so righteousness and purity are an equivalent. So when we are dealing with the cleansing of the sanctuary, we are dealing with purity and we are dealing with the purifying of God's reputation and we are also dealing with God's people being purified and being cleansed and being justified and the sanctuary being justified. Made right with God, the blood that justifies. So we are made with right with God. It is the blood of Jesus that justified. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding blood, there is no remission. The author argues that the earthly sanctuary underwent a purification when it was first inaugurated. This is uh, from the Andrew Study Bible commentary on, uh, he, on these uh, verses in Hebrews, 18 to 21. We continue to see here, the typological meaning of the Day of Atonement is fulfilled by Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. The cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary points to a second function of his work and includes a work of judgment, the remission of sin. The passage establishes that the heavenly sanctuary needs to be cleansed. And this is also from the Andrews Bible commentary. So we see this investigation imagery, the angelic beings looking down at the blood on the atonement cover. So there is an investigation taking place. The blood represents the blood of Christ that covers those who accept. Cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. So, when we look in the book of Daniel chapter 7, we see these three parallel sequences in Daniel 7, 8 to 14, in Daniel 7, 20 to 22, in Daniel 7, 25 to 27. Number one, in the first sequence, there's the little horn. There's the books that are seen, the books that are opened in heaven in this investigative scene. In, in other words, this Day of Atonement scene. There is destruction. There is the kingdom of God. Sequence 2, Daniel 7, 20 to 22. Again, we see the little horn. We see a judgment, which corresponds to an investigative judgment. And we see kingdom. Again, we see the little horn in the third sequence. The court seated. This investigative judgment scene is an investigation. Destruction of the horn and the kingdom. Now, the, the, the investigation isn't because God needs to investigate. God knows everything. But it is for the sake of those celestial beings. The angels don't know everything. The cherubim don't know everything. Let us continue. Daniel 8, 9 to 14 gives us this sequence again, Daniel 8, 9 to 14 and 20 to 25, but this time, instead of the judgment or the books or the court seated, we see the cleansing of the sanctuary. So in this sequence, we see the little horn, 
the cleansing of the sanctuary, which is the investigative judgment, as we saw that investigative imagery in it, not only with the cherubim looking down at the blood, but also with people having to do what? As we read earlier, afflict their souls, afflict their souls. And then the little horn is broken. So after this cleansing of the sanctuary, the little horn's power is broken. The investigative judgment, the cleansing of the sanctuary, both are equal. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Papal Rome came into power long after the earthly sanctuary of the Old Testament became obsolete. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, that is, Jesus is the minister, Jesus is the high priest in the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. In verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 8, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Jesus made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So the old covenant with the earthly sanctuary is vanishing away in Christ who establishes the new covenant and he is our great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, he's now in the heavenly sanctuary, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Hebrews 9.1 Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary. So the old covenant, the first covenant, had the earthly sanctuary. Hebrews 8, 4 and 5, For if he, that is Jesus, were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy, that's the earthly sanctuary, and shadow of the heavenly things. There is a heavenly sanctuary. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, the earthly tabernacle, for he said, God said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So the earthly tabernacle was made after the pattern. It was a shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. First Chronicles 23, 28. Because their duty was to help the sons of Aaron. So the, the priests, the Levite priests. What was their duty? to help the sons of Aaron in the service of the house of the Lord, in the courts and in the chambers, in the purifying of all holy things, and the work of the service of the house of God. Hebrews 9.21 Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels, all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things, in the, in the heavenly sanctuary, the heavenly things themselves, with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place, holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. See, Jesus was a one-time sacrifice. He didn't have to offer himself over and over. Having an investigative judgment, prayerful mindset of self-investigation. And we considered that on the Day of Atonement, the people had to afflict themselves. They had to be in prayer. It was a Sabbath day of rest. It was a time of prayer. It was a time of turning your... So we have to have that investigative judgment mindset. Since 1844 has come, and we are in the time 
of the heavenly day of atonement in the time of the investigative judgment. Being a living sacrifice, that is what we are to be. Romans 12, 1, Colossians 1, 27, we'll look at those verses. Romans 12, 1 tells us, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. What are God's people to do as a living sacrifice? To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So people have to see Christ in us, the hope of glory. Ephesians 3, Ephesians 3, starting verse 8, says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be made known by the church to principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So we think of that image of Daniel chapter 7, 10, where we see that heavenly investigative day of atonement, judgment, and those celestial beings there, thousands upon thousands. And then we think that it is the, that the church is under investigation. Who are the people of God? There is an investigation. Who has accepted the covering of the blood of Christ? Think of the investigative imagery of the cherubim looking down at that blood, covering God's people. to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Like I said, it's not because God needs to know who his people are, but as we were talking, all of those angelic beings, all of those celestial beings who have a question and who want to know, this investigation is largely for their sake and for them to understand the judgment and fairness of God. And so the fairness of God is vindicated. The character of God is being vindicated. And while that is happening in this end time period of Earth's history that we are in, we have the duty of setting the record straight, putting sin in its rightful place, correcting the misunderstandings done to the character of God. According to the eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access and with confidence through faith in him. So Jesus is our high priest. First Thessalonians chapter three, starting in verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So the process of God's people being purified as we grow in the sanctification process, as sin is moved to its rightful place, as this cleansing of the reputation of God is happening, as this cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is occurring and sins are being blotted out, God will have a people that will truly reveal the love of God. Growing in holiness is growing in love. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 4 through 8. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. See, we are the evidence of the gospel. The testimony of Christ is to be confirmed in us. So in this heavenly court scene, we are the evidence of the righteousness of God. So that you come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting the revelation there's that language that connects with the book of Revelation in these passages. The revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will 
also confirm you to the end that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God is going to have an end time church. And, and that church is clearly going to reveal who his people are. And they're going to be revealed through this process. Through this process. The wheat and the tares are being separated. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ. So the effects of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary are now being felt on earth since 1844. The gospel is being cleansed in one sense. The gospel which was misunderstood and misrepresented throughout ages is being cleansed and the Seventh Day Adventist Church has within it the pure gospel. And that doesn't mean everybody within the Adventist Church has received it. But doctrinally, it was in the, is within the Adventist church and it is to be shared. This end time, everlasting gospel, the correct gospel. There are confused gospels in the world. There is the idea, the Calvinist idea of, what is the Calvinist idea of predestination? That some people are predestined to be saved, some are predestined to be lost, and it is God that determined that. No, that's not the gospel. God has given us free will. We make the choice. God didn't, God didn't, um, predetermined that sin would enter into the world and that some people would be sinners and that God didn't predetermine all of those things. It was a result of free will. And then there, is a, there are gospels that say, well, you don't have to keep the commandments of God. The law is nailed to the cross. You can do whatever you want. There is all kinds of confusion in the church. Or there's other gospels that are not really gospels that say you've got to work your way to heaven. No, the true gospel, so this end time, true everlasting gospel must be revealed. And it is within the doctrines of the Adventist church. That doesn't mean that all people who call themselves Seventh-day Adventists know it, but it is within. Leviticus 16, Hebrews. Jesus is our high priest. There is a heavenly sanctuary. So in 1844, and this is a very simplistic childish illustration, but you have Jesus moving into the second apartment ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, some people ask questions. Well, does that mean he wasn't in the presence of the Father and until 1844? And what does that mean? There. And again, remember, the earthly sanctuary was only a shadow. How much does a shadow look like the object? It's only a shadow. So we cannot limit the heavenly sanctuary by the limitations of the earthly sanctuary. The earth is ripening rapidly. Evil will be revealed clearly as well as good. The children of Christ and those who are not of Christ, the sheep and the goats, his remnant is going to be exposed. There will be that final harvest. That final harvest of ripening is happening and there will be a harvest. And God's people will be ripe and the devil's people will be ripe for destruction. The truth will prevail about God and not go out. It will always be there to compare with man's alterations and perversions of the truth. We are to reveal his ways are better than man's. As evil increases, so will the knowledge of God's truth and will stand as a witness against the world. We are called to be his evidence and to share the light to the world, the everlasting gospel, the assurance of salvation must be clear to us in the church. Sharing it is part of the refining process as well as study and discussion. Iron sharpens iron. Fire refines gold. So Jesus died for us. He was the ultimate sacrifice. And he ended the Old Testament sacrificial ceremonial system. He covers his people. He offers his covering to all. And those who have accepted the covering of Christ, those who have truly accepted it, are revealed to those heavenly intelligences. And how the gospel works is revealed in that investigative judgment scene. And so while that heavenly 
cleansing is happening, while that heavenly atonement cleansing of the sanctuary investigative judgment is happening there, we are in the final stages of earth's history where those who are in Christ and those who are outside of Christ are ripening and being revealed. Who has the true gospel and who is receiving the counterfeit? So what is going on in heaven is affecting earth. How do we stand firm? Philippians 4, uh, Philippians 3:20 to 4:1. And I will close by reading from Philippians. Philippians 3, and starting in verse 20, tells us, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await the Savior. We, we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be confirm, conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. So that was Philippians 3.20 to 4.1. That is how we stand firm. We stand firm in Christ.